Hello and welcome to the lecture, The Geologic History of Earth, Relative Dating. In this video, I will be demonstrating how geologists relative date a landscape and geologic outcrops to determine the sequence of events that occur uh, within that landscape and outcrop. So, to begin, we got to look at the first thing that basically says that Earth is 4.5. Point uh, five four billion years old. Okay, now this is absolute dating the actual Earth, and this was done using some relative dating principles as well as absolute dating principles, which we'll talk about in a different uh, video. So, looking at this, whenever we start talking about relative dating, you have to understand some basic principles first. And two of those basic principles are catastrophism or uniformitarianism. Okay, and so with this, what we're going to be looking at is we're going to be differentiating these two underlying theories, and then we're going to be looking at the principles of relative dating and how you go about doing that. So, the first thing that we have to look at is we've already discussed that the Earth is 4.54 billion years old. Okay, and, and so we have to look at the conflicting theories. And of course, one of the actual uh, primary conflicting theories is through, of course, the biblical aspects. Okay, what you're seeing here is Archbishop James Usher, okay, has actually derived from biblical accounts that the earth is actually only about 7,000 years old. Now, of course, whenever we start looking at this, uh, what Archbishop Usher did was look through these biblical accounts and actually backdate it back to October 22nd, 4004 BC was actually the creation of earth. Okay. Now, so what this is saying is that the earth is actually very, very young. So this is one of our first theories that we're looking at, and this is the actual biblical account, which was not accounted for. But whenever you start talking about the geologic aspects that were accounted for, what you're looking at here is George Cuvier. George Cuvier pr proposed the principle of catastrophism. Catastrophism actually says that all of the geologic landscapes that you see today are a result of catastrophic events. So whenever you see things like the, the Grand Canyon, the Grand Canyon was created by a catastrophic flood as water eroded away that landscape, created, creating that vast chasm. Well, of course, with the principle of, of catastrophism, this also indicates that the Earth is a very, very young Earth as a result, okay, because everything was created by catastrophic events. Mountains are a, a violent, quick process. Um, river channels are a violent, quick process. And so you look at all the landscapes that are um, seen across the, across the globe, these are all a result of catastrophic events. Well, of course, it wasn't until James Hutton, who is considered the father of modern geology, proposed his use, uh, principle of uniformitarianism. The principle of uniformitarianism basically states that the processes that create landscapes are actually a very slow process, very similar to those that we actually see today. So if you go out and you start to watch a, a rock weather, this indicates that this is a very, very slow process. And of course, how he derived this is by looking at one of the most famous outcrops uh, that you see in the background here, and that is Sakar Point in Scotland. And so by looking at this actual landscape, he derived his principle of uniformitarianism stating that everything that is created on earth is the same process as we see today and therefore they are very very slow and as a result this indicates a very old earth so these are the two uh, underlying principles that you're going to see now there's other scientists that of course are geologists of course that have had an influence Charles Lyle, uh, Charles Lyell took the principle of uniformitarianism and he um, placed one of the most famous statements in geology, the present is the key to the past, uh, on the principle of uniformitarianism, and that completely stuck, okay? <clears throat> and all the present is the key to the past basically says is the processes that we see today. If we see mountain building going on today, if we see uh, river 
riverbed construction, if we see all the geologic processes occurring today, they are, of course, exceptionally slow, and that applies to past events that have occurred on Earth, indicating an old Earth, as I've mentioned. Okay, now, whenever you start looking at um, just geology in general, geology in general is basically, its whole job is in, to interpret past events on this planet. Okay, and of course one of the most famous geologists is John Wesley Powell. On his voyages down the Grand Canyon, uh, what he actually noticed was, is he noticed that the record of the history, the past history of Earth, is actually recorded in the rocks. And so if we study these rocks, we can actually determine what the past environments and, and what the landscape was like way back in history. Okay, and so as a result, um, John Wesley Powell kind of set a foundation for geology of interpreting past events. And that's what we've been doing in this class is looking at rock layers and looking at rocks and saying, what are the past environments? So again, it's more like uh, he noticed that these rocks uh, and their layers act as pages in the book of the Earth's history. And so that's what we're going to be looking at. We're going to be looking at how do we go about reading the book of Earth uh, and interpreting all these landscapes. All right, so now we're going to get into the dating aspect. Whenever we start talking about dating of rocks, we're of course talking about two ways that we can do this. We can relative date, which is just putting in a sequence of order. So this event occurred first, this event occurred second, this event occurred third, and so on and so on. Whenever we absolute date, that's when whenever we actually assign an, a, a true age to the actual rock. So as you can see here, 120 million years, 140 million years. Uh, we'll be talking about absolute dating in a different video. All right, so what are we looking at here? Relative dating focuses on the sequence of events in a landscape. Okay, so what we're going to do here is we're going to put these layers into an actual order of occurrence. Okay, and to do so, we have five basic principles of actual relative dating. The first one is superposition. The principle of superposition basically states that any rock layer that is on top of a pre-existing rock layer is going to be younger than the layer it is on top of. So you can see here this the Skinner Gulch limestone is actually going to be younger than the Hamlinville formation which is younger than the Foster City. So what we're looking at is we have to put these things in in order from the youngest uh, event uh, to the oldest event. Now of course remember that these types of rocks the Skinner Gulch limestone is an indication of the environment, uh, which we learned in the last unit. And so those are how you're going to actually put this together. Everything starts to intertwine now. Okay. The next principle we're going to be looking at is the principle of lateral continuity. If you notice that that, that canyon is actually cut out there and then on the opposite side you see the same exact rock layers. Well, lateral continuity basically says that if you have the same rock layer on the other side of an event like that stream erosion removed that rock layer so it's kind of like it ripped that section out that basically indicates that the rock on the other side is the same age as the rock on the uh, closer side so in other words you see where it's labeled Skinner Gulch limestone and then you look at the rock layer on the other side that rock layer is actually the same age so that's the Skinner the Skinner Gulch limestone still, and therefore it is the same age. Original horizontality. Uh, original horizontality is basically a principle that states that any time you see layers of rock that are tilted or have been deformed by any earth process, this means that uh, that tilt or that event that caused that tilt is younger than all of the uh, layers that it actually tilts. So we notice here how the Larsenton, Foster, Hamlinville, and Skinner, they are all horizontal, right? But then you get to the Leaf Junction and the Birkeland Formation and all of those that are below, you notice that those rocks are tilted. Well, the, the event of tilting has to be 
you know, put in there. So that would be like a plate tectonics aspect. And what that did is those rocks were deposited horizontally and then they were uplifted and tilted. And then after the uplift and tilt, the Larsenton, the Foster and Hamlinville and so on were then deposited on top of that. Okay, so that's what you're looking at there and how you actually use the original horizontality. So you can put that event of tilting into your sequence of events that have occurred. One of the more uh, most commonly used ones other than super, uh, superposition is cross-cutting relationships. Any rock layer that cuts across a pre-existing rock layer means that it is actually younger than the rock that it cuts across. So if you look at the uh, the pink dike, which is of course a representation of a rhyolitic dike, and how it cuts across the Larsenton, the granite, the Birkeland, um, the brown layer that it cuts across that is not labeled, that the principle of cross-cutting relationships indicates that that dike is younger than all of those that all of those rock layers that it cuts across. Okay, but notice how it does not cut across the Foster City formation. So that indicates that that dike is actually older in relative terms than the Foster City formation. Okay, so you got to be careful with that and make sure that you understand uh, that it's you can't make any assumptions. You just have to look at the landscape and actually put it into its order. And then the last one we're going to be looking at is the law of inclusions. The law of inclusions is kind of very difficult to understand because there can always be some tricks. But just imagine that granite that you see here in this landscape has come up and it's ripped off chunks of uh, what is called a uh, wall rock. And by ripping off those wall rock, it became incorporated. It, it didn't melt whenever the granite was just a magma that was solidifying. So it ripped off the rocks and you see chunks of the Birkeland formation within that granite. Well, what that actually indicates is, is that because that is an inclusion, that means that the Birkeland formation had to already be there to actually um, be ripped off and incorporated into that granite intrusion. And so therefore, anytime you see inclusions, the inclusion part is older than the rock that it is included in. Okay, and so that'll really help whenever you start looking at some of these where you're like, okay, let's put these events in order. But once you do that, you're going to be able to see how it actually works out. Okay, so going through each one of these, you can see here, superposition, younger, uh, on top, older on bottom, lateral continuity, those are actually the same age. Original horizontality, they were all laid down horizontally and then they were tilted. Cross cutting, the dike cuts across so it is younger than the horizontal rock layers. And then finally the last one is the inclusion is older than the rock that it is incorporated into. Now of course whenever you look at this you got to be careful uh, because there are some tricks but we're not going to worry about that. So. Here's what we're looking at. This is your first practice here. Um, you can kind of stop the video right now. And what I want you to do is place these into a relative order of currents from the youngest layer that is labeled to the oldest layer that is labeled. Stop this video now and actually complete that task. Okay, so what you've actually found is that you should have got that F, B, K, N, A, J, D, M, H, C, L, G, E. That is the relative order of occurrence uh, for this actual cross-sectional diagram. And so what you've done now is you've just actually accomplished the principle of relative dating. Okay, you've relative dated this using all of the different principles uh, that apply to this actual landscape. Now, of course, you start looking at the letter H there. This is, it's cross-cutting because it's not a dike, it's actually a fault, but you're still using the actual uh, principle to help relative date this landscape. Okay, next I want you to go ahead and look at this one, and I want you to stop the video and go ahead and relative date this sequence.
Okay, what you're going to see here is that R is actually the youngest. The river is the youngest because of the principle of cross-cutting. F, L, V, E, H, D, C, E, H, J, M, G, Z. Okay, so what you've done now is you've gone ahead and you've put this actual in there um, and you've relative dated all of these actual, uh, this, this landscape. So again, it's all about using the actual uh, principles to help you do so. Now, there is one problem that you're going to arise is sometimes we have what are called missing pages of geologic time, these unconformities. Okay, and so whenever we start talking about an unconformity, these are missing periods of time that have been removed or erased from the record uh, by a geologic process, typically by erosion. So in other words, you're going to find a gap where it's like it's not in a sequential order. It's kind of like it changed drastically. Okay, so for example, you can see this landscape right here, and what you notice is, is you notice how you've got the horizontal bed, and then you have that line that is easily distinguished there where it separates this. Well, that is an unconformity. Okay, so in other words, an erosional process, in this case, it was an actual glacier, and how I know that is because of the poorly sorted sediment on top, uh, which is kind of one of those clues that we'll be looking at. Um, actually, basically uh, removed rock layers and then deposited different sediment on top. So that is called an unconformity. Now with this, there are three types of actual unconformities. There are what are called angular unconformities, disconformities, and nonconformities. An angular unconformity is what you see here. What this means is, is the rock layer below the unconformity itself is tilted. Okay, and because of that, that's, this is then described as an angular unconformity. The unconformity is the erosional boundary, and then you look at the rock layers beneath, and you see that they're angled, and that gives it the distinguishing name of an angular unconformity. The next type of, of uh, unconformity is actually called a disconformity. Okay, this is whenever you have an unconformity that is between two sedimentary rock layers that are horizontal. Okay, the way I always looked at this is it is actually disguised. So whenever you look at that, it's very hard to distinguish these disc, you know, these disconformities. But because it's actually between these two, between these two sedimentary layers, it is then given a distinguishing name called a disconformity. Okay, the disguised aspect is an easy way to remember it. And then last but not least is your uh, third type, which is called a nonconformity. Nonconformities is whenever you have that erosional boundary on top of igneous or metamorphic rock. And as a result, this is now called a nonconformity. So what you can see is, is the three types of unconformities are named differently based on what the pre-existing rock layer is beneath the unconformity itself. And so whenever we start looking at this, what you start to see is you start to notice that there are periods of time. In, in the Grand Canyon, we have something called the Great Unconformity. The Great Unconformity is missing something like 200 to 225 million years of history. So we don't know what the history was like during this time frame, uh, so there's a big gap from the Proterozoic age rock found at the bottom of the of the Grand Canyon to the Tapit sandstone. It's like a big jump in history, okay? And that history is missing. So think of ripping chapters out of a out of a book, okay? And that's exactly what happened here, giving us this gap in knowledge. And so this is why it's so important whenever geologists study history of landscapes, you start to actually put together these stories. So it's kind of like taking a bunch of books that have different chapters miss missing and you put them all together. And that's called the principle of stratigraphy. And we'll be looking at that uh, in, a, in a video that we're going to be addressing that later. 
Okay, so this concludes the geologic history of Earth relative dating, and I hope this video has helped you understand the concepts of how geologists relative date our landscape.